My name is Brett. I'm pastor of this people. It's good to see all of you today. Um, it's uh, the first time I've been with you since the New Year, so let me say Happy New Year to you. Um, there is no question that our New Year, uh, I, many, I know many were hoping that this year would be better than last. Uh, it hasn't turned out, at least circumstantially, to indicate that it will be. And I would like for us as a church to do what the church can do best to bless the world. There are many things that we can do that only we are called to do. And if we don't do them, they won't get done. One of them is preaching the gospel. And many times we relegate that to the back seat because we think other facts and things and issues are much more important to address. But the church is the only one that can bring the good message of salvation that helps communities be better and secures people forever. We're the only ones that can do that. We don't sacrifice one for the other. We just bring both. So we have to do that. But the other thing we can do that is singular in its power and orientation is pray. God listens to us. I'm not saying he doesn't listen to anybody else. He'll heal the cry of the helpless, the orphan, the widow. But he has, he has prescripted his, his, his workings to hear from his people. So when we talk to him, we'd best not waste our breath. Let's go ahead and begin to let the words of our mouth articulate his agenda rather than our own. Therefore, his will is done on earth rather than ours, and we agree with him. And so I'd like us to pray for our nation today. Tomorrow is a moment where we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, birth. And we, as a congregation are really his sociological dream children. We live in the Commonwealth of Virginia, a wonderful state, a state in which I am proud to adopt. I was born in Kansas. Kansas is better. Eh, I know you're mad at me now. <laughs> but everybody loves home cooking, so I'm not ashamed. But I love my state. But I realize that without the efforts, the push of a man like that, the dream we are now living would not have been possible. The seat of the Confederacy is 100 miles south. And yet, our staff and our congregation is so diverse that sometimes when people walk in, they don't know what we are. You've you got a black pastor, but you've got white folks on staff, and you have a Latino congregation that's, that worships here on Saturday night, and you've got a Korean congregation, and you started a church in Vietnam with the Vietnamese. What, what are you all? Exactly. Something that you have never seen on the earth because we started in heaven. It says in Revelation, every tribe, every tongue, every language was at the throne. What was in heaven wasn't on earth 50 years ago. But because of somebody who had the courage to go ahead and step out and be disliked, to be hated, and indeed to be assassinated. We have the privilege of dwelling in a southern state like this. There's no way I could have been your pastor in 1960. No way white folks, no way Latinos, no way Asians, no way. And I'm grateful for that man's sacrifice. Please honor him with a thought tomorrow. And I want to pray and ask God to heal our nation. We had, a, we had a bad couple of weeks. And I don't know circumstantially whether it's going to get a whole lot better. I spent a lot of time in prayer. We, last week we prayed and fasted as a church. That might be foreign to many of you who are watching virtually or here. Fasting, you, what, what was that? You, you, we gave up food. And we did so because we, we feel like whenever we do that, um, let, me, let me put a comma there. Fasting is not a hunger strike. We're not trying to twist God's arm in order for him to do something for us. Right. Fasting is saying this, God, food is absolutely essential for my life. I realize I cannot live without it. But I need you more. I need you more. So I sacrifice that which I need to get what I have to have. And because I'm giving that up, I'm, I'm asking you to fill me with your presence. 
Give me information that I wouldn't have otherwise. I submit myself, I humble myself before you, realizing that the things that I have that have satisfied me physically are not enough for me to do what I need to do spiritually. So I need more of you and less of that. Help me, oh God. And we did it for five days. People fasted, whatever they needed. Please don't think that somehow we are super holy because you didn't eat for five days. No, some people just went till five o'clock. Some people fasted other things. And I really don't, I'm, I'm not trying to figure out, I'm not the fasting police. Going around thinking, did you really fast right? No, I'm, I'm just trying to say, in order to do this thing, you need to give up something that's necessary in order to get something that you can't live without, meaning God. So whatever that is, I'm good with that. But people did it. And I felt something that happened last week in the spirit. Now we did it not only in our, our local church, but we did it in concert with our every nation world, which happen, happens to be the organization under which this church finds its home. A family of churches all around the world that believe the same of reaching the college campuses and touching the community and planting churches. <laughs> it's a great group of people. And I've been walking with the leaders of this movement, even though we're only 25 years old. I've been walking with them for 40 years. My best friends on the planet, some of them. And so we did it together, believing that God is going to re meet us in each one of our communities. But I felt something happen in our congregation and for our community as we fasted last week. And again, circumstantially, I don't know that it's going to get any better in our world. In fact, I think it's probably going to get worse. But I don't know that there's any organization that functions in worse, better than the church. Only just a few amens on that point. I probably need to say it again with much more joy when I say it. I don't know whether there is any organization that functions better and worse than the church. In difficulty, the church has always shined. There's no better place for a flashlight than in the dark. Are you listening to me? We're about to enter into our greatest moments. So do not fear. God is with you. Pastor Jim had a powerful word on Friday night, Pastor Jim Christian, regarding how we needed to view our reality. On Friday night, we had a prayer and fasting ending meeting. We, I enjoy those, by the way. Those are really nice when we come together to end the fast. That's really good. But our prophet spoke to us out of Isaiah chapter 6. And it's when Isaiah was in the temple. And he was there because his leader had just passed, Uzziah, great king, 51 years, I believe, 52 years. And Isaiah was born in, in Uzziah's reign. So it's the only king he knew. This good king has passed. There weren't many good kings. He was a good one. Made a mistake at the end of his life, but a really good king. And Isaiah was really torn up. He was the lead prophet in the nation. And he didn't know where to go, and so he went to church, went to the temple. And now he was in between a leader who had been and a leader who was to come. Didn't know what, would his, what it was going to be like in transition. And as he's there... He says, all of a sudden, I was in the presence of God, and he was on the throne in the temple. As he was in transition between two leaders, he was looking at the one who was really in charge. God showed up to him when he was insecure about what transition looked like. Are you listening to me? Which gave him courage to say, oh, even though it matters who's on the throne here, it doesn't matter that much. As long as I can see you, it says, and I saw the Lord on the throne and his train filled the temple. And the angels cried out, holy, 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 which means different is he than any other ruler on the planet. Different is he, holy, set apart, distinct from everything else in the world is he. And Isaiah Realized who he was and saw himself differently. Church, listen to me. He saw himself differently. As he began to look at him, all of a sudden, his own humanity began to be exposed. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. This was the prophet of the nation. 
the one who was supposed to have the cleanest lips, the one who was supposed to communicate best to everybody. He says, I realize I'm not qualified to talk because I've been concentrating on the natural so much I forgot about you. I've been thinking about who left and who's coming and I forgot about who is and who was and who always will be. My mind got so focused on the natural, I forgot about the spiritual. <laughs> Such that I couldn't talk well. I couldn't speak well. Fear came out of my mouth. Partisanship came out of my mouth. Nothing of spiritual benefit to anybody came out of my mouth like I'm supposed to because I'm a prophet of Almighty God. My lips are messed up and I'm your vessel. And the people of I represent, they're worse. <laughs> Help me to speak about what I've seen. Help me to tell people to bring security about what I've seen. You're on the throne. Even though it matters who's on the natural throne. It doesn't matter near as much as you being on the throne. And nobody can take you off. Help me to let the people know that. Now, in order for him to be able to speak well, and I'm preaching on stuff I did not plan, I'm not going to go real long today, so I'm going to shorten the other part of my sermon. <laughs> <clears throat> in order for him to speak well, it wasn't just a commitment he had to make. It wasn't just a revelation he saw. It says an angel. One of these angels, one of these cher seraphim, ser whatever they were, cherubim, seraphim, came and had some tongs in his hand. And, and he went to the altar in the temple. And the altar was lit. And he took some, some coals from the altar with these tongs. Now, the, the coals were so hot, the angel had to use tongs. <laughs> no, wait. The angel took the talk, took the call for the altar, and he started moving toward Isaiah. <laughs> now, can I, can I just do some dramatic interpretation? <laughs> what you going to do with those things? <laughs> Why are you coming to me? Oh, no, you got to chase me all around church, bro. You ain't catching me with that. I know y'all go speed of light, but you've never seen a brother run this fast. You're not coming at me with that. <laughs> it says he took that coal with the tongs and placed it on Isaiah's lips. Is there anything more sensitive in your body than your lips? <laughs> That's what I need to cleanse me. That's how messed up I am. Hear me, when you get in the presence of God, don't leave too quick simply because you see something good. Let God do the painful. Let him touch the sensitive parts of your life so that you might be able to communicate well without insecurity and fear. It changed Isaiah's life. And hear me, when we talk to God here in a moment about prayer, let those tongs with that coal, having touched your lips, change your communication. Not only in here, but out there. Are you listening to me? Father in heaven, we love our country. God, we love our country. But it's broken. It's broken. And it, it didn't just break this week. It's been broken for a long time. Just folks didn't know it. And I'm asking you, oh Lord, to first comfort the survivors, the loved ones who lost family members on January 6th. Please have mercy on them. Strengthen them. God, that you would, as we approach this inauguration this week, protect, spare, cover. Please, please God, cover everyone who is involved so that no life is lost. No military, no civilian, no appointed, no elected, no life is lost. I pray for President-elect Biden that you would open his eyes to see you and govern according to your goodwill. I pray for President Trump that you would protect him 
from all those who would want to harm him. That you would open his eyes to see you like he never has before. Lord, I'm asking that you would help the members of the House and the members of the Senate to bow their knee to you, to come to a knowledge of who you are in a special way and bring this nation back to God, back to you. But Lord, if our nation does not serve you, we want you to know we will. We align ourselves more with the kingdom than we do our nation. We love the church more than Rome. And so we choose you. Every day we choose you and your goodwill. Have your way with us and help us to speak with you well and to speak to people well with your good news in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me over to the book of Matthew. We're going <clears> to <throat> go through a series on our values today. Um, well, actually, we're not going to do a series. I'm just going to preach all five of them today. And next week, I'll be preaching on our mission and vision. At the beginning of the year, I do this to kind of set the tone for where we are going for the balance of the year. And we as a congregation are fairly focused we have some things that hold us to the ground, some values that kind of anchor us, things through which we run everything in ministry. And if they don't fit through this matrix, we don't do it. And there are five values that we hold dear. One, we love the Lordship of Christ, obedience to Him, what it means to let Him rule and reign over our lives, sit on the throne of our heart, not as the co-ruler, but as the ruler. And we submit to him and his will as it's found in his word. Two, we love evangelism. We want to see people right with God. And we, we want to go out and preach this gospel. If it means that we make, we make enemies through it, so be it. If it means that we lose friendships, so be it. That is not to say that we are trying to make enemies or lose friends. We're trying to gain friends and make enemies advocates. That's what we're trying to do. But if this good gospel causes us to go to the cross, we've already been there because we have given our hearts, hearts to Christ. And we care more about people's eternal security than we do their relationship to us and friendship. So we preach this gospel because we love them like that. We do not want them to die in their sin. We wanted to know the good God who gave his life for them. When we see them right with God, we believe in discipleship. Helping them to discipline their lives so that they can follow Jesus, walk with him daily, be a consistent follower of Christ. Once we see them become a disciple, we believe in leadership development. Leadership development is helping people understand what God has called them to do after he has called them to be. So they are supposed to be disciples, but then they are supposed to do things that benefit the world in hopes that they can make the world really better. That requires some degree of not only proper action, but generally you, you can't do a whole lot of things by yourself, so you're going to have to be a leader if it's just leading your family to be better, leading a, a, a soccer team as a coach, leading your community bridge club team, leading whatever you might have. You know, maybe you're a, a team leader at your work. Becoming a really good leader because the world really doesn't know where they ought to go. Neither do Christians for that matter. That's why they need a shepherd. And then after leadership development, we have family. We believe that family is that which needs to be emphasized in, in the Bible. Uh, emphasized in the church from the Bible. Family in that we are teaching parents to be really good parents. We're teaching husbands to be really good husbands and wives to be really good wives. 
helping this nuclear family become healthy and strong because that is the basis for all strong communities. Secondly, we believe there's a great benefit to spiritual family, that we as a people are not just a, a congregation of, of individuals, that we are actually trying to be family together, that we are spiritually brothers and sisters because we call God the Father, Daddy. And as a result, we live together in harmony. These five things bind us. They help us to do what we are called to do better. And so today we'll go through them. First, the Lordship of Christ. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 24. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do many miracles? Didn't we cast out demons? I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He's talking to church folk. I'm using that in the, in the loosest sense of the word because the church had not been birthed. He's talking to people that he believes are ascribers to the Jewish religion at the time. But he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in. Now, when he speaks about the kingdom of heaven, I don't believe he's talking about necessarily heaven itself though it could be the people are just using the name of Lord in order to play religion really well and aren't serious about the relationship with God at all and thus they won't get into heaven itself because they've never given their heart to Jesus they're just practicing vernacular but when it comes to somebody who really has given their heart to Christ and then they play Christianity and they really don't live it then we have to say well what does that mean well, I'm, I'm one who espouses the idea that if you've really, at some point in your life, surrendered your life to Christ, then you've got a reservation in heaven. That's secure. But there's much more than just you going to heaven. Christ prayed that we might have the kingdom here. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? How? So the prayer that we pray, that Jesus taught us to pray on a regular basis, first starts with bringing kingdom reality from heaven here, not us getting there. I must say, I'd, I'd like to get there someday. It's going to be real nice. But I'm not in a hurry. And so I got to figure out how in the world I can bring that here. When Jesus says, won't enter into the kingdom of heaven, not many who say to me, Lord, Lord, he's talking about the reality of what it means to live in such a way that you are expressing and experiencing the kingdom here. Listen, church, this is why you have a staff that works so hard. Most people out there in the world don't know what I do. Pastor, like how many hours you work a week? Okay, you got three services on a Sunday normally. What, three hours a week you work? <laughs> you want to do an internship with me for a week? We work really hard because it's not just, a, not just about a performance on a Sunday. We're about constructing kingdom reality so that people who come in here can live well. And there's, there's not supposed to be any place on the planet that has the concentration of the kingdom more than the church. Now the kingdom is broader than just heaven because it's supposed to be here, but the, it's broader than the church as well. And that kingdom principles can be reflected in your business. They're supposed to be in your home. When people walk over the threshold of your, your front door, they ought to experience kingdom reality in your house. And so the kingdom is bigger than the church, but no place on the earth is it to be expressed with greater concentration than in the church. And so this staff works hard to try to make sure that in every ministry we have, whether it's out there to the community and distributing food, or whether it's in here caring for babies and changing diapers, kingdom is reflected in strength and concentration with integrity. So that if that which occurred here was actually happening in heaven, God would go, good job. There'd be no qualification to his affirmation. That's kingdom. Jesus said, if you don't live right, 
If you don't obey me here, you won't enter into that here. And I, I know everybody can picture somebody now who calls Jesus Lord, but is not living in kingdom. I hope that wasn't a mirror to you. We can all point to someone who's a real good religious person. And if you push the right button, they'll give you a hallelujah. But they are at the club. They're doing all kinds of stuff. They're gossiping. They're doing everything wrong. And you sit there and you... Now, nobody's questioning whether they're going to heaven. But they aren't entering kingdom here. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. will end. I, We are trying to produce kingdom here. How? Through his lordship. We want to obey. Are we perfect? Nothing about us could ever be confused with perfection. We've blown it more times than I could count personally, me. But there ought to be something consistent about our witness. And even when we blow it, we run back to the people that we've offended, or we, we, we face the thing we've done wrong, and we repent. I'm sorry I blew it. I really messed up there. Please forgive me. If you don't, I get it. But I can get, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pledge I'll never do it again. I want to honor my God, and I want to love you well. That's the way we do lordship. We obey him. We don't just use him as, as fire insurance to keep us out of the condemnation of eternity. We want to honor him as our, our God and master. Secondly, we want to preach his gospel. Evangelism, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. The last thing Jesus said is, go and preach. If you're a disciple, you go and you preach evangelism. We're not trying to grow as a church by church transfer. Now, if you came from another congregation, glad you're here. Welcome, Matt, is always out. But you are not our target. Our, our target is the world. People who don't know a thing about Jesus. And if you are here, from another church, we are going to intentionally help you reach them. You are not here just to get happy and healthy, though we want you more happy and more healthy than you presently are. You're here, you may not know it, to be equipped to help us reach the world. This congregation is about changing Washington, D.C. It's about winning the city. Mm, that's next week. Evangelism. <clears throat> <clears throat> discipleship, what it means for us to take somebody who's been one and then help them live right. Discipleship is not about controlling somebody's life. It's not about telling them what to do. It's about being a disciple yourself and, and letting your life be a springboard towards somebody else's progress. It's saying, listen, I've been there before. Let me tell you what the scriptures have to say. You need to be discipled, people. It's not just enough for you and Jesus to get together about life and, and hope it goes well. It's better than nothing. It's really good. But you want best? Find somebody who can pour into your life. Now, I've been walking with Jesus for 40 years. Been in ministry for 39. Yeah, somebody thought it was a good idea. Seven and a half months after I was right with God to throw me into ministry. Full time paid, though I had to raise my own money. <clears throat> they didn't think me that good. <laughs> they weren't willing to pay me. But when it comes to the idea, I've been in this thing for a long time. I am still in need of discipleship. I have people in my life that I call and say, help me with this. Help me with my family decisions. Help me with my kids. Help me with my business. My business. Church, help me with my relationships, how I structure reality. Help me, please, because it's not enough just for me and Jesus to make decisions. And you say, well, wait a minute. Is it Jesus enough for you? Yes. I'm the problem, not him. I don't hear well enough. I don't perceive well enough. I have flaws in my own life whereby I want to kind of interpret the information and, and drive it toward that which might be more inclined to, to make me happy than other people happy in my own soul, making decisions on behalf of others that really make me please, not them. I mean, you, you got a pastor who thought it was a really good idea 
at his, at his second uh, 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 Valentine's Day to buy his wife a vacuum cleaner for Valentine's. That's, that, that's me. I'm that guy. So I don't trust me. I do not trust me. I don't know why you trust you. We're all born of Adam. We all got the same bent going the wrong direction. I need discipleship. So do you. Somebody who's just a little bit further along than you in God, in whatever area. It might be finances. It might be family. They don't have to be further along in you and God in everything, just in the area. Now, if you can find somebody <clears throat> who is further along in everything, that's really good. But we want you to be discipled. So you need somebody to help you in that area. Leadership development. Boy, we need good leadership. <laughs> leadership is willing to lay down its life for the sheep. And that's what leadership does. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. You know, whenever, whenever God goes to the pattern of how he wants his people to be led, it's generally not through a monarchy. It's not through government. It's by shepherding. Jesus could have chosen any moniker, any title he wanted to put on his door to let people know who he was. And everybody wanted him to be king. Everybody. Please, save now! As they cried when he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, what we call the Sunday before the crucifixion. Save now! You are our hope! You're the Messiah! Do what you do to deliver us from these evil leaders, Rome and Herod, and all the Jewish population who, who happens to be in charge. Save us! Instead of calling himself what he could right, rightfully have done, Messiah, on a regular basis, this is how he identified himself. I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. They won't follow another. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now the shepherds were the most despised occupation in all of the, the, the ecclesiastical world. The priests, all the scribes, everybody who was religious didn't like shepherds. They liked what they produced because they liked to eat. And they liked the clothes that the, the wool produced. But shepherds couldn't come to church on a regular basis, couldn't go to synagogue on a regular basis, couldn't attend the, 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 the temple worship because they had to care for their sheep. They couldn't, they, 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 they continually broke the Sabbath because they had to work on a day when the sheep still needed to be fed. And so they were considered less than. And this is one of the reasons I'm convinced that Jesus was announced by the angels to shepherds. Do you realize who God could have told the Messiah was born? Bethlehem is just six miles from Jerusalem. Caiaphas was there. The high priest was right around the corner. All the religious leaders were there. God didn't show up to any of them with his angels. He went out to some shepherds, caring for their sheep at night in the field, and said, by the way, somebody like you, just been born. He's going to, his profession is yours. God is counterintuitive. He always does stuff that is opposite of how we think he ought to do it because we value things he doesn't and he values things we don't. We need to switch our brains. Being a really good leader is being a really good shepherd. I don't have time. Lastly, family. My wife makes it easy to be, a, to be married to her for four, four, 34 years. She's the best. Unapologetically to every other woman in the room, my wife is the best. Best woman since Eve. Nobody better. 23 years of homeschooling educating five grades at once, dealing with my crazy schedule of being gone 100 days a year and she's still holding down the fort, progressing our children, all of them. My youngest is now a junior in college and all of them have graduated. I mean, they're all doing... One of them still is working through it, but the rest of them have graduated. <laughs> they're smart people. They're leaders in their own right, in their own little worlds. They are the ones that determine what's right and what's wrong. They are respect. Listen... 
I'm so happy with my adult children. I don't know what to do. And it has so little to do with me because she is so great. She did so well with the homeschooling. We actually threw her a retirement party as a family. <laughs> yeah, 23 years of homeschooling. 23 years. And hear me. This is true. I know it sounds nuts and maybe it's a, it's a, a, a hyperbolous husband. She hasn't complained one time in our 34 years about anything. Never heard a word of complaint. And, and I give her a lot of reason to. Not one word of complaint ever. She's a better Christian than I am. She's a better woman than I am, man. She makes it really, really easy to be married for 34 years. Having said that, I make it really, really hard on her to be married for 34 years. We work hard at family. We pray and fast. We cry out when we have disagreements, not to one another, but to God. Sometimes our disagreements last for three or four days. Anybody married understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> well, what is the Bible? I mean, doesn't the Bible say don't let the sun go down in your anger? Yeah. We're not mad at one another. We just disagree. So we sleep pretty well. But we get up the next day and we say, you know, we need, to, we need to figure that out. We need to talk about that. And both of us are going to God in the midst of it because he is the anchor for both of us. And the interesting thing is this. If we are separate on an issue, I'm here, she's here, and we are both going to God who's up here, the more we go to him, the closer we get to one another. Are you listening to me? We believe in family. And we believe in raising seven children. We've, we've had our challenges in being good parents. We've never been bad parents. We've just been Adam and Eve to our kids and that we haven't been enough. And so we have asked God to help us be, especially me, uh, Lord, if, if these kids had a better dad, they'd be better kids. Every time I disciplined my children, and I, I did it in such a way that was biblical, we had Home Depot sticks around every corner. I carried one in my back pocket around my house all the time because sometimes I couldn't find one. And he'd do something, he'd do something. We had two girls, but usually he'd do something. And it'd be too long before I could get my, my thing in order to let him know uh, through, through very uh, targeted communication. See, there are sensory nerves that go from the bottom straight to the brain. And when you communicate through a Home Depot paint stick, your displeasure, they understand differently than when you just say no. Now I realize some of you have been abused in your past, and this sounds frightening to you that anybody would use an instrument to strike somebody. But we did it biblically. We did it biblically. We didn't abuse. I would sit there and I'd talk to them about what it looks like uh, to, to have disobeyed. You know you did this wrong. You really blew it. And if you want testimony, you can go to one of them right here. He went through a lot of them. A lot of them. <clears throat> you know you did wrong. You stole your brother's Batman figurine. You know you did that, right? And, and then you hit him over the head with it. That was really bad. You can't do that. You can't do that, son. So let's talk to God. Tell God you repent and you're sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. And repeat after me. I will never do that again, and I pray you'd forgive me. Good. Okay, now, pull your pants down. Come on, come on. Come here, come here. I love you. Truth. Our discipline sessions would take 10 minutes. It wouldn't be just a slap and get on about, I'm so mad at you, get on about your life. Don't you ever do that again. Wouldn't be that. Take 10 minutes. I would not let them leave until they were happy because I wanted them to know that my discipline had nothing to do with rejection. It had everything to do with training for righteousness and then I accepted them regardless of what they did. So they walked away happy. In pain, yes, but happy. <laughs> we worked hard to produce kids that understood who God was in the midst of our discipline so that they could look through us to him. 
And we work hard here in the church at producing an environment that is family in its orientation. We tolerate one another's weaknesses. We endure one another's idiosyncrasies. We're not always criticizing one another for that or this. We do correct one another when there are biblical wrongs. And we develop a culture that, that is inviting of correction in our lives because all we want to do is be better for God so we can be better for people. Yet in the environment of correction, we try to produce an, an, uh, an environment of affirmation whereby we are affirming one another more than we are correcting one another because correction, continual correction, and a lot of it seems to make people discouraged. And we want to make sure that they understand the, the passage of Scripture. It says, encourage one another. In Hebrews it says, as long as today is called today. So we... We, we constant, I send off texts all the time. You're doing great. Good job in the exhortation today. Wonderful worship today. When I'm on my phone down here, I'm not answering email. I'm working. I'm telling people what needs to change. Fix that. Hey, great job. That was fabulous. What you said there, amazing. And I do it now because four hours from now, I'll forget and I want to make sure they know what I think about their performance immediately. When I'm at home on Wednesday, because we record our Wednesday services here on Sunday, I'm watching. I'm sending off texts. Oh, that was great. That was amazing. Do I have to know? They're paid to do it. They're paid to do it. But in order for me to produce an atmosphere of affirmation, I've got to make sure that I am telling them what I think God thinks about them on a regular basis. The Lord was so pleased with that. That was great. You made us and him happy. Then when I, when I have to come and say, that was a dumb comment. Why do you say that? Oh, gosh, you don't go there again. Stop that. They're saying, oh, that's right. And they receive it. They feel my arms around them, and they go away happy even though in pain. Are you listening to me? This is the environment we try to produce. Family. Because that's what God wants his church to be, one big family. Now, because I said so many things I did not plan to say at the beginning of the sermon, I had to truncate this one and didn't give you all the scriptures, so I'll try to pick it up next week before we go into our mission and our vision. But at least you understand something about our value system in this church and why we are the way we are. And everything we do about this, everything we believe about our values, helps us to sustain the diversity we have, which is always weighty. It's hard enough. Most pastors don't want to do this. Most leaders don't want to do this because producing a church is already impossible. I mean, a real church, it is already doing the supernatural and the impossible. Adding to it the diversity that we, we, we intentionally put in the mix makes it even more difficult. Thus, we need to have this value system that allows us to keep our diversity strong and consistent so that we can do what we need to do and be the community that is able to speak to issues out there that other congregations can't. And when we talk about the things that are tearing up our world in terms of diversity and ethnic tensions, there are very few congregations that can talk to it like we can. Because family to us is different than family to them. Mm. Let's pray. Lord, I'm asking for your grace, please. Empower us and help us to be the kind of people who can serve you well. Is there anybody this morning who has yet to give their heart to Christ? Maybe you've made a decision in the past, but your life doesn't look anything like what a believer's ought to be. And today, you want to make a change for the better. If you fit in either of those categories, raise your hand high. I want to pray for you. Anybody at all, raise your hand high. Anybody in the room? See that hand. Bless you once you're... Once you raise it, you can put it back down. Bless you, bless you. All right, you who raised your hands and those who did so, signifying that you raised your hands in the virtual world, pray with me. Say, Father in heaven, forgive me. I am sorry for the way I've lived. I choose to turn away from everything I know to be sin and to follow you with all of my heart. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. 
And thank you for giving me the privilege of calling Jesus the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we've got a New Believers Toolkit here for you. In here there is a Bible, Bible study, pen and a pad. Go out to the front there in the foyer, turn right at the information desk, and somebody will give you one of these. Online, if you, if you prayed that prayer, there's a little box at the bottom of the chat. Check that. That says, I raised my hand. And then another box will appear at the bottom of the chat. Check that, and somebody will contact you so you can be helped at securing this decision and moving forward. Uh, and those of you who made the decision in here, that's all we want for you is to move forward in the right way.